Hi everyone. Welcome to Wild Voices Online. We're just letting everyone log in to join us today. And so it'll be a couple of minutes before we get started, but while we wait, I will put up a poll that you can choose for today. Just a fun question to vote on while we wait. Um, the question for today is, which of these birds do you like the best? Duck, owl, eagle, hummingbird, robin. I just picked a few. There's so many different birds that we could have picked, but of these birds, which birds do you like the best? Duck, owl, eagle, hummingbird, or robin? Okay, um, welcome everyone who's joining us. Um, we're just giving it a couple minutes to let everyone log in um, and get settled in to get started for today. And just while we wait, a fun question for you to answer of um, which of these birds do you like the best? I had to pick a few, so your absolute favorite might not be here, but of these birds, which do you like the best? Duck, owl, eagle, hummingbird, or robin? Okay, we'll give it a, one more minute um, to let people join us for today. Um, and just while we're waiting for those who have joined us in the last moment, um, we're just, um, if you want to vote while you're waiting on which of these birds do you like best, um, duck, owl, eagle, hummingbird, or robin, you are welcome to do so. Okay, I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds and then we'll get started for the day. So if you haven't chosen yet, um, which of these birds do you like best, go ahead and do that now. I'll give you 10 more seconds to choose. Okay, and I'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. Well, let's see what you said. Okay, um, so most people picked hummingbird um, as their favorite bird. Um, out of these choices. And then owl came in a close second. Some folks are a fan of the eagle as well. And then a couple people also chose um, duck and robin. All right, thanks everyone. Um, we're gonna get started. So my name is Christine. I work for the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network. Um, and at this time of the year, we're gonna be coming to you on Wednesdays and Thursdays in May and June um, for these online learning sessions. You can find more just like this at cbean.ca slash wildvoicesonline. There's still a few more coming up in June and there's also the recordings of the sessions that have already happened that you can watch. Um, so for today's session, you are muted, which means that we can't see or hear you. So if you wanna ask a question, maybe our presenter says something that you wanna know more about, you can click on the little speech bubble on your screen there and you can type your question to us. And your questions can only be seen by myself and today's presenter, um, but you can ask them at any time during the presenter. We'll answer them when we get to a good pause point so you can send them on any time. And when we have a moment, um, I'll ask the questions on your behalf to our presenter for today. Um, but please be patient with your questions. Um, just send your question one time. Just like in the classroom, we might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll do our best to uh, work through all your questions and, um, and answer them. Okay, and then just before we get started here, I just wanted to ask what grade you are in so that we know um, what grade are the students who are joining us today. I put up a poll there so you can just choose. Are you in kindergarten, grade one, two, three? four, five, six, seven and up. I'll just give this one um, 10 more seconds for you to let us know. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you said. Okay, um, most people joining us are in grade two, but there is someone from every grade joining us today, which is awesome. Welcome everyone. Okay, and so 
I'm going to pass it over to our presenter in a moment. Today, um, Patty is going to be presenting um, citizen science techniques in a migratory bird study. Patty lives in Cranbrook and she's an applied biology technician. So she's going to be teaching us today about identifying birds. Um, I'll pass it over to you, Patty. Okay. Um, I think Patty's just going to get her presentation um, started for us and then we will get going. Hello, I'm going to be your presenter today and we're going to be talking about citizen science techniques in a bird mig migratory study and we're going to be learning about some techniques biologists use in the field to do research as well as some, some things you're going to be looking for in your survey when you're out doing your bird survey. So let's get started. So what is a bird? A bird is a living thing and a bird needs air, food and water to live. All birds have feathers, which help them fly and keep them warm and dry. They also have birds beaks and they're called mouths. Beaks can be very big or very small, depending on what the bird eats. They can be short, thick. Beaks are good for eating seeds off the ground, while thin ones are better for eating bugs out of plants. And they all have feathers. That's what's in common. They all have feathers, all different kinds. And they're waterproof. I wonder why. Were they born that way? Let's find out. Well, birds pick up oil on their, by rubbing, they pick up oil on their beaks by rubbing against the gland near the tail down here. And it's called preening. And they rub it all over their feathers and this coats and insulates the feathers. So the water cannot penetrate, penetrate through the oil coating. And the feather is then waterproofed. Okay, we have one poll question, Christine, maybe. All right, I put up a poll there, um, a question about feathers for you. What do you think feathers help birds with? What are those feathers for? What do they help the birds with? You can let us know. Okay, I'll give you um, five more seconds from here to decide just what you think that the feathers help birds with. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you said. Um, most people definitely think it's they help with flying. A few people think they might help with floating, swimming. Um, nobody picked mm. eating though. Flying and floating, yeah. Flying and floating. Okay, let's go. Now we're gonna learn some basic bird features and characteristics that you'll be looking for. Yeah. We're gonna learn about birds' beaks and feet. Oh, um, hi, Patty, just jumping on hi. here. Um, I think you um, did share it just as your PowerPoint, but not your full screen. So we're not seeing the slide player come up. Um, just stop share and then we'll uh, restart your share um, so okay. that we can see everything. Yeah. Okay, I got the screen or the power, or, oh, okay. Select screen and then make sure you select um, to share your audio as well. 
Yeah. I got the PowerPoint there too. Um, yep, yeah. just share your screen though, because um, we'll still be able to see the PowerPoint. I think you've selected PowerPoint again. Um, so just try that one more time and I, PowerPoint will be an option. Um, but if you don't select your whole screen, we aren't going to be able to see the slide player when you open it. Oh, no, actually, we're good. Never mind. You did get it. Perfect. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's opening right now. So we are good to go. I'll let you continue Perfect. on, Patty. I'll... Thank you. So here we go. We're going to be watching a, a slideshow here. Um, these are bird beep and feet adaptations. So let's see. Birds have different kinds of different kinds of beaks because they eat different things. Which bird has the best beak for catching and eating fish? And which has the best one for catching and eating bugs? Bluebirds catch and eat bugs. Pelicans catch and eat fish. What do you think these birds eat? They're, they, they're scavengers and they eat dead animals. So these are fly catchers. They have small pointed beaks. What do they eat? Well, they eat insects. See the size of their beak? Okay, these are warblers. And what do they eat? Warblers eat insects too. And raptors, they capture and eat prey. These birds can eat a variety of things, meadowlark, oriole, and jays. Robins have pointed beaks and can eat a variety of food, fruit, seeds, nuts, acorns, and these guys, house finches, grosbeak, cardinal, they eat seeds, insects, and fruit. What kind of beaks do these wading birds have? It's a night heron, you got an egret, an ibis, and a heron. And these birds like to eat fish, crayfish, shrimp, and other creatures in the water. What kind of beak do these ducks have? Well, these ducks, this is a northern, northern shoveler, and it has a large flat beak, and it sips through the water like a sieve. Now, there's a lot of birds that have different types of feet, and they're used for different things. So, Let's see these birds here. What do you think they're used for? So, how about these ones? I wonder what they're used for. And this is a hawk. And his beak is pointed and his feet pick up prey. So, I wonder what these are used for. They look like insect and bug beaks. Birds, these birds' feet are for perching, catching prey. These guys wade in the water and these guys swim. That's what their feet are used for. Yeah. Now this guy here, this golden cheek warbler, has small claw-like feet for perching, and it has small pointed beak for eating insects. Yeah. Okay. I 
got some games you guys can play too. This is a feather feather game. It's kind of an interesting game you can play. This one here is a beaks and feet matching game you can play. And we have another poll question for Christine. All right, I have another question to ask you um, about what do all birds have in common? Um, your choices are they have beaks, they have feathers, they can fly, or they can swim. What do you think all birds have in common? I can see that choices are coming in. Thanks for letting us know what you think. Um, you can just let us know your, your best guess, your hunch on what do you think all birds have in common? They have beaks, they have feathers, they can fly, they can swim. I'll give this one um, five more seconds for you to choose if you haven't already. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, let's see what you said. Uh, most people chose that they have feathers, um, but some people also are guessing it's probably mm -hmm. that they have beaks. And some people say it's that they can fly and a couple think maybe they could swim. That might be what they have in common. What is it, Patty? It's, the, they have beaks, but they also have feathers. Yep. So both of those are right? Having yes, beaks they're right. Feathers. Yep. But, can, but not all birds can fly? Not all birds can fly. Penguins cannot fly. Interesting. Okay, now we know. Okay. They have, have feathers. That's what makes them birds. Yeah. Hey, can you guys see my whole screen? Um, not right now. So um, if you click um, share from current slide, it'll bring us up to the one that you have open right now. That's oh, perfect. No. Okay. No. Oh. Okay. Well, we it's okay. Selected, but we are. I went back. It's okay. We're going to learn now about why citizen scientists and biologists go out and collect data. Well, they do to do research. And they collect data about migratory birds to find out how well they're surviving and coping in their habitats. They can count populations to understand any changes in migration populations and find out where they stop over and when they may return home. They also collect other important data. Um, Patty, you've, uh, appear to have gone on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. They also collect other important data such as age, sex, breeding, how many eggs they lay and how many can survive. They collect blood and feather samples to tell them how important the information is about their health and their habitats where they live. So these are some of the techniques that biologists use in the field to collect data. Banding, capturing, netting, transmitters, measuring, weighing, feather sampling, male or female blood samples. And they make, we make nest boxes and floating nest boxes, as well as we use webcams and drones. So let's watch a little um, YouTube video. And hopefully it comes up. <laughs>
studying the migratory connectivity of the black blade plover, the long-billed curlew, the red knot, and the marbled godwit here in the south coast of Texas. And migratory connectivity is basically the, the linking of individuals and, and populations of, of animals, in this case birds, throughout their entire annual cycle. That means figuring out where birds that spend the winter in places like North Padre Island actually migrate and where they go to breed and then where they come back again. Here we have ideal conditions weather-wise and in terms of the ecological integrity of the area and we've also got that for an extended period of time. So this place is really productive all year round for birds that are breeding here, birds that are migrating here, and birds that are wintering here. One of the reasons we know so little about migratory connectivity is we haven't been able to track them. We just haven't had the technology to be able to track these individuals over space and time. And so it's the advances we're seeing in smaller and smaller tracking devices that's really allowing us to gain these really critical insights into the biology of these birds. Thanks to a grant from ConocoPhillips, we can track these shorebirds using two types of transmitters. The first type is a 9.5 gram solar Argo satellite transmitter. They turn on for 10 hours and then they're off for 48. For the 10 hours the transmitter's on, it's collecting collecting data points and sending them up to satellites. Now the other transmitter type we're using, it's a 3.4 gram archival GPS Argos satellite transmitter. And this is the first time we're really using this transmitter. These transmitters are collecting 30 GPS points and they're storing it on the transmitter. And after it takes the 30th point, it will turn on and transmit to the satellites. Capturing shorebirds is, is a bit of a tricky thing during the non-breeding season. We have to use something called a cannon net. Along the beach, we position this device pointing towards the shoreline, and then we try to force the birds into this area where the net will actually fly. Convincing a bird or a group of birds to go in front of one of our nets is obviously very tricky. In order to do that, we've essentially kind of got to get into the birds' heads and try to figure out what they're thinking and what kinds of things are going to make them react in different ways. Once the birds are in that point, we hit a switch, net blows out like a cannon, and falls harmlessly on the birds, and then we all run up there and grab these birds. Once we have the birds in the hand, that's when we really start to process the birds. We'll put a USGS aluminum band on their leg, we'll put a flag on the band that uh, has a number on it and it's readable with binoculars at a distance, and we also take a feather sample, take a blood sample, measure the bird, and then we put the little satellite transmitter on the back of the bird, tie it, knot it, make it fairly permanent, and we let the bird go. In general, shorebirds as a group are declining by over 50% since 1968. A big problem in part because we just don't know where or why they're dying. And that's sort of the, the thing we're trying to figure out ultimately is what's causing these birds to die? What's causing their populations to decline? And so it's the advances we're seeing that's really allowing us to gain these really critical insights into the biology of these birds. And those insights, I'm hoping, are ultimately going to help us protect them and to work towards conserving these wonderful species. Okay, we got one more to watch. Pacific Flyway is a major north-south corridor for migratory birds in America, which extends from Alaska to Patagonia. Every year, a huge variety of birds travel some or all of this distance in spring and in fall, following food sources, heading to breeding grounds, or traveling to overwintering sites. 
Scientists at the Hakka Institute's Calvert Island Research Station on British Columbia's central coast have started a banding program to gain a better insight into the birds along this section of the Pacific Flyway. With the use of special mist nets, dozens of species of bird are caught, measured and weighed. They are examined for any signs of injury, as well as to determine their gender and age. All of this information can be valuable for conservation studies. Before the birds are released, they are given unique numbers marked on small metal bands, which are carefully fitted to the bird's leg. While the process of bird banding is informational as individual birds are studied, the real use of bird banding comes from recovering or recapturing previously banded birds. Bird banding is a non-invasive, long-term method of observing and studying birds without interfering with their natural behavior. The data collected from this program contributes to North America-wide monitoring, research, and conservation programs, as well as improving our understanding of bird movement worldwide. So we also have floating nets. Uh, they're floating houses that we use for ducks and water birds to make nests in, and it's kind of a shelter. And that's what they look like for the wetlands. We use camera traps. This is a camera trap. And we make some nest boxes, and we put those out. We use drones that have cameras on them so we can get in and find out more information closer to the flock of birds. So we have another poll question for Christine. Mm -hmm. Let me just yeah. put a question up here. So the question is, um, which of these are used by citizen scientists for tracking migratory birds in research? Um, cannon nets, recapturing, banding, satellites, or all of the above. You can let us know what you think um, based on what we've learned so far. What do you think that are, what of these are used for tracking migratory birds in research? Cannon nets, recapturing the birds, banding, using satellites, or perhaps all of the above. Okay, I'll give us um, five more seconds from here to choose if you haven't already. Five, four, Three, two, one. Let's see what you said. Okay. Most people guessed all of the above are used. Um, yeah. People felt strongly that one in particular was uh, was the one. What all of the above. That's the correct answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, most most birds migrate and they travel at certain times of the year because they cannot find food and homes to stay warm in the winter. There's no berries or seeds or insects around, so they have to fly where it's warmer to find food and make a nest. This is called migrating. In the fall before winter arrives, birds will eat a lot of food so they can get enough energy for their trip. Then when temperatures and winds are just right, that's when they leave. They will make stopovers and rest and eat and drink and then head off again. Each bird knows where to go and where to make their new home, usually the same place every year in the spring and in the fall. Most birds will fly in a V-shaped formation to conserve energy. And some birds will travel over thousands of kilometers to their homes. Some may take on the trip nonstop, and some travel at speeds up to 30 to 40 kilometers an hour, just almost how fast we go in a motorbike or a car. So let's watch one of these movies here, and we'll see what I'm talking about.
Have you ever gone on a trip away from home? Maybe you travel in a car to see some family or took a plane to go somewhere fun on vacation. Well, did you know that a lot of animals take trips too? Many different kinds of animals move from one place to another, and when they do, we say they migrate. But not all kinds of trips that animals make are considered migration. When Squeaks moves from the lab to the kitchen, we don't call that migration. Sorry, Squeaks. But Maybe we can call it snack time. Most of the time, migration means moving over a long distance. So animals can migrate to different parts of the country or even different parts of the world. Now, migrations also happen at a certain time. For example, you might have seen birds flying south for the winter. That's a kind of migration. But they're not just going on a trip for fun. Animals migrate for good reasons. Many birds migrate in the winter because the weather is just too cold for them. So they need to go someplace warmer. Other animals migrate long distances to look for food. And sometimes creatures migrate so that they can have babies in a place they know is safe. It doesn't matter if the animals move over land, through water, or in the air. If an animal moves a certain distance and does it at a certain time, it's a pretty good bet that they're migrating. So what are we waiting for? Let's take a look at some cool animal migrations. Let's meet the champion of migration on land the caribou. Caribou live way up north in places like northern Canada and the state of Alaska. And one group of caribou, called a herd, moves around this area in a big loop. And they do it every year. For most of the winter, this herd of caribou lives here, right on the border between Canada and Alaska. Then in early spring, around April, the caribou go on the move. They travel about 600 kilometers north to an area near the ocean. And this place near the coast has lots of good food for the caribou to eat. So this is where the mother caribou have their babies. But it's not such a great place for long. And that's because by the middle of summer, the coast becomes home to big swarms of mosquitoes and other biting insects. So the herd goes on the move again, but this time they move away from the ocean. Then in the fall, when things start to get really cold, they move back down south where there's more food and the weather is less harsh. Finally, when spring arrives, they start all over again. And at the end of the year, some of these caribou have walked almost 5,000 kilometers. Whew. Now when it comes to migration in the sea, whales go farther than any other kind of animal. Lots of kinds of whales migrate, but the whale that migrates the farthest is this one the humpback whale. Most kinds of humpbacks spend the summer in cool waters up north, near places like Alaska. All summer, they eat things like shrimp and small fish, building up the energy they'll need for the trip they're about to take. When the water starts to get too cool, the humpbacks swim south to warmer waters, near Hawaii and other tropical islands. There, the whales rest and have their babies, and they stay there until the babies are strong enough to swim back north. And it can be a long swim, too. The longest recorded swim for a humpback whale is over 15,000 thousand kilometers. But one animal that's in the running for making the longest migration ever is the Arctic Tern. This bird isn't very big. It's only about the size of the ruler you use at school, and some of the time it lives near the North Pole. When winter comes, though, it doesn't just go a little bit south. The Arctic Tern flies over 35,000 kilometers to the very tip of South America. That's about as far south as you can go. It's not only one of the longest migrations by air, it's one of the longest migrations made by any animal. How do all these animals find their way? After all, they don't have maps or phones or computers like people do. Well, different animals have their own ways to keep them from getting lost. Some animals look to the sky and use the stars, moon, and sun to help them find their way. Others stay on the right path by watching the landscape and following features like mountains and rivers. Caribou, humpback whales, and arctic terns are just some of the animals that make these amazing journeys. But fish, insects, and even jellyfish migrate too. That's something to think about the next time you're on a trip. Thanks for joining us on SciShow Kids. Do you have a question that you'd like us to answer? Ask a grown-up to help you leave a comment down below or send us an email to kids at SciShow.com. See you next time. Birds have a substance called magnetite which is located just above their beaks. This is a mineral that the birds use to help them determine Earth's magnetic fields so they can navigate, which means they're gonna migrate using true north. 
When migratory birds have to travel from north to south or vice versa, they align themselves with the magnetic field lines and travel to their location. Along with this, migratory birds may also find their way by creating a mental map of their route using mountains, rivers, and stopover sites for resting and eating. Birds in migration can travel as far as 500 and 33 kilometers. They reach their destination in time. Some travel at speeds over 30 miles per hour. And some also travel eight hours a day. And it would take some birds 66 days to reach their migration destination. Birds in migration can travel as far as 16,000 miles. That's a long, what, long time. So these birds have this magnetite. And here it, here it is. It looks like a nose, kind of. Um, it's magnetodo, mag, magnetoception. Most birds, it's a very important for bird migration. Some bees have it and they detect magnetic fields. This is how they know where to migrate and how to come back to the same place every year. And it's found in rocks and minerals. It's a source of iron ore and it's been identified in the brains of birds, bees and humans. When mag magnetite aligns with Earth's magnetic field. It stimulates nerve impulse. So that's a really neat, interesting fact about migratory birds. So I have a spring and winter migration map and the migration routes of flyways of the North American birds are the Pacific, the Central, and Atlantic and Mississippi. And I kind of have a map here, but you can't really see it. Um, so we're gonna learn a little bit about this map and it's gonna show you what times a year that they migrate. So. So this is in real time. So you've got January is dark blue. Light blue is about February, March. Yellow, it's coming down now, is about July, August, September. October, December is red and they go all the way in the winter is red. So they're gonna go way down south. Now they're coming back up, it's January, it's March, and we live about right here. Right about here. So this is kind of interesting. I also have another map to show you. Um, it's right here. Now, We've got your Pacific Flyway, your Central Flyway. Here's your Pacific Flyway, Central Flyway. Mississippi Flyway is kind of red, and your Atlantic Flyway is blue. Now, we have a lot of birds that go through here, and we've got the flycatcher, and he goes through all of them, and he's right here. We've got the plover and he, he goes about around here. So up and down, there's quite a few. So the, we've got the blue heron here and he goes through all, all the flyways. A lot of interesting birds.
Another bird question for Christine. Yes. Uh, one moment while I bring that up. Our question here is about bird migration. The question is, what does bird migration mean? Is it when birds go to sleep? When birds get cold and hungry? When birds want to travel? Or when birds cannot find food and a warm place to stay? You can choose which one you think it is. Okay, I see people are making their choice. Thank you. I'll give you about five more seconds from here to make a choice of which one of those you think it is. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you said. Okay, most people said um, it's when birds um, can't find food in a warm place to stay. Um, and then a couple of people think maybe it's when they go to sleep or when they want to travel. Um, which one is it, Patty? It's, they're, they're right. It's when birds cannot find food in a warm place to stay, but they also travel. So, but that's the correct answer. Right. So it's, it's more that they start traveling because they can't find exactly. their food in a warm place to stay. It's not necessarily that they, yeah. they want to travel. It's not like they're thinking, hmm, I really want to go on vacation right now. That's that right. They need to, to find what they need. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Back to you, Patty. Okay. All right. Migratory bird identification during your outdoor survey. Now, I just want to explain, this is a track in the snow and it looks like a bird of prey came down and swooped up and picked up a mammal of some kind that was running this direction. So that's kind of his wingspan. Kind of a neat, interesting uh, tracks. Okay. You're gonna be looking for bird shapes. And these are all of our bird shapes here. Um, I have other bird shapes too. But we don't really need to do that right now. Okay, so we're also gonna be looking for, does your mig migratory bird have a crest, which is kind of like a hat on the top of its head? So these, funny looking birds, all have different kinds of hats. They're crests. So that's what you're gonna be looking for too. Kind of interesting. You're gonna look in for bird colors, all different kinds of bird colors. You're going to be, um, I have a migratory bird. Uh, another thing you can do here, it's a migratory bird identification. Now, you also have another activity at the end of today that you might wanna do with your parents or your teachers. And it involves food, picking up food with beaks. So I'm just gonna explain about the bird's beaks. So this bird here is a hummingbird and he eats the nectar out of flowers. It's kind of like a, his beak is like a straw, similar to a dropper. And this one here, he eats bugs and flies and stuff. And it's kind of like a toothpick, his beak. It's American Avocet. This guy here is a sparrow and he's got a small, tiny, really strong beak. And it's like a nutcracker. He eats nuts and seeds and cracks them open. And we got a kingfisher here. And his is like a sword. He spears them. So he eats fish and all different kinds of mammals and invertebrates. And he eats snakes and all different kinds of uh, other things in the wetlands. Now this is a scooping bird and he scoops his stuff up like turtles, frogs, and that's a pelican. This one here is a meadowlark. And he's got a, a long pointy beak and it's like a tweezer. 
So he tweezes up pet caterpillars and stuff like that. This bittern right here, he's got a straight beak and it's strong and it's like tongs. And you're picking up snakes and frogs. This guy here is like a duck, it's a mallard, and he siphons all his food through his beak like a, a strainer that you strain spaghetti in. And this guy here is a falcon and he eats rabbits and stuff like that, small little mammals, mice. And his is like scissors. So he tears apart his food. And with their feet, you've got perching, remember? Some are semi, semi aquatic, some are for paddling, which is a mallard duck. Some of them are for grasping, that's an eagle. Hummingbirds have really small feet. You've got woodpeckers that are for climbing. And you've got egret that has three toes for wading. And then you've got your dove for scratching. So let's practice because you're going to be going out in the field. So sometimes it's very hard to see the birds' feathers as they move too quick and fly away while you look at them. So let's look and listen at some birds that are singing to see what things we can spot in a hurry. You will have to try to find out as much as possible about the migratory bird by looking at its features for 30 seconds, see what you can remember and try to look at the color, shapes, feet, heads and beak for one minute. So let's try. This is a warbler. So let's see. Come on. There it is. Okay. So this is his song. So what color was the warbler's belly? How about what shape was the warbler's beak? How about what, what did the warbler's feet look like? Were they perching? Were they for wading? What color was the warbler's head? Did it have a hat or a crown? How about, did it have a long tail or short tail? Did the warbler have stripes or spots on its body? On its belly? And what was the warbler doing? Okay, the warbler, the shape, I think was a nutcracker. He was perching. He did not have a warbler's hat on its head. Did the warbler have stripes or spots on its body? It was singing. So let's go see. We've got a flicker we can come back to next. So Look at these pictures. We've got a cardinal and we've got a wood duck. And colors, the colors are different. These are both, the, these are the same birds and so are these. These are cardinals. 
Now this one here is a male because he's really, really bright colored. And this is a female. She's really dull colored because they have to hide. They want to have their babies and hide. And this, this is a wood duck. And you can see the differences between male and female. Yeah. And I wonder if you can spot any of the similarities and differences between the messenger here, the harlequin here, and the golden eye. Now, there's a lot of differences in these water, in these migratory birds here. So there's some same, look at the colors. How about the spots? Funny looking heads. I don't think any of those are the same. How about their beaks? Some have stripes. There is a puzzle you guys can do here. It's a puzzle game that you put together. Now I want you to watch. Now this is really interesting thing here. I want you to watch this. It's a YouTube video of a plover and I want you to see if you can find it. Just while you're bringing up the video there, Patty, I just wanted to give you a, um, a time uh, check here. It's about 10.50, so I think after this um, we'll take some questions. Does that sound good? Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, there he is. I don't think anybody could spot him, but there he is. Okay. All right. Okay. This is a thing you're going to take on your survey with you. It's got interesting questions. <laughs> Okay, we can take questions. For sure. Um, so I have a few questions here. I just sent out um, to everyone who's here um, a link to the bird survey that you can do after the presentation. Um, based on what we've learned about birds, you can go out there and see if you can survey different birds and spot the birds in your area. Um, but we'll do some questions right now. Um, let me see what we should start with here. Um, somebody had a question about uh, one of the techniques for um, observing birds of drones. They're wondering, wouldn't drones be kind of loud and scare the birds away? Sometimes they do. They, they try not to go too close to them. So they're usually up higher. So they kind of um, fly above them, quite, up, quite high above them and they can detect how many populations are there in a, in a big swarm of birds. So instead of using a helicopter or going in by person, mm. um, it's very easier to use a drone because okay. it can collect so much more um, footage. That makes sense. So they're not getting yeah. up close with the bird with the drone, but someone's using the drone to kind of get somewhere where the drone can see the birds from above. It's kind them. of like a land mapping. 
Um, oh, very interesting. Yeah. That makes sense. I was wondering that as well, how the drone wouldn't scare the birds away. That, that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, do all migratory birds fly south? No. Well, migratory, if they're migratory birds, yes. But they, a lot of them migrate to Alaska. A lot of them migrate north, like the Arctic Tern. He goes north, but he also goes south. He goes through, I think, three different continents. He flies. So there's a lot of different, um, they don't just go south. Some of them go east and then they come back down and some of them go back up north. So oh, like the snow, snowy owls and stuff go north too. Interesting. So yeah. they basically, they migrate in the direction where they know they're going to get what they need. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, okay. well, I had lots of good questions. Let's see what I will have next here. Um, oh, how does the V formation help the birds save energy? It's kind of a wind turbulence. So it's like a wind turbulence. It's like hiding behind, like ha have you ever been in the wind and you try to hide behind something or been on a fast roller coaster and you're behind somebody and, and you can feel the wind on your face? It's kind of like that. It helps every, all the birds with their energy so they don't have to use energy anymore. And they actually sleep. They do sleep while they migrate. Some birds go to sleep, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. How do they mm -hmm. keep flying if they're sleeping? Well, they, they have a way of resting, which is called sleep. They know where they're going. It's, it's, they're not fully sleeping, but they're resting enough that they call it sleep. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, that birds could do that. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, what issues affect migratory birds? Like they, they're traveling over such long distances. Do, it sounds like maybe some migratory birds are having issues making those migrations. Is there things that... There is a lot of stuff that affects migratory birds. And it's from, um, oh, a lot of their overwintering sites in the winter and stuff like that is not there anymore. And in the summer, sometimes it's not there and it's from building things on it or it's just from disturbances. It can, it's also from um, other invaders taking over their territory, um, from oil spills to pollution, to all different kinds of stuff. Like when, when they do the um, migration game that I have for the extension, you will learn a lot of different things about how, how much hazards that they face. It's awful. It, yeah, it, they have a really rough time migrating. Mm -hmm. um, and actually that's a good um, thing. For, I'll just quickly mention that um, because you can send questions to us in the chat, but I can also send things out to all of you I've been putting some links in the chat there that link to the extension activities that Patty has picked for us um, to do afterwards. Um, so I've been sending out some of the links there. I have the bird survey and then I just sent out the game that Patty mentioned. Um, and there will be more um, activities and resources that Patty has recommended that will also get sent to you tomorrow by email. So the email that you or maybe your teacher or um, somebody registered for you with um, those will be sent to you tomorrow and there will be a, uh, Patty has made a really great long list of different things for you to check out um, if you want to learn more about birds. So that will come out to you tomorrow. Um, but for right now, if you wanted to grab those links from the chat before the presentation ends, you could get started on some of them today. Um, and I think we just have a couple minutes left, Patty. Okay, we'll I'm, I'm going to share, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, and I'm just going to share this because I, I had a little bit. Um, I, am I sharing right now? Yes, um, I'm seeing the, can you spot the American Bittern? Um, no, but I can't see the picture, can you? And neither can I. Um, I wonder why. 
one minute left, Patty, um, before we do have to wrap up for today. Okay. I was thinking maybe so, one last question, and then um, I think that's oh, all sure. the um, But I just wanted to ask, um, what inspired you to learn more about and work with birds? I've always enjoyed doing everything out in nature. So I love um, being outside. I, I've actually done this for about 10 years now, um, doing stuff with biology. And I just thought doing stuff with birds would be more interesting than um, some other things. So that's kind of why I'm interested in birds. But I'm also interested in wetlands and other stuff too. So it's not just, I like birds. I like everything <laughs> that's wildlife. So I'm interested in everything really. Um, I don't really have a preference. Um, I just think all wildlife's interesting and want to learn more about it. So I've been learning all my life about it. So I just want to teach others more about it, what I've learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like you're um you're passionate about conservation as well. I am so animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And actually, I think that is our time for today, Patty. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yes, and I thank everyone for joining me today. All right, thank you. Um so we'll let you all go uh today for today and um go next time you're outside, go see what birds are around, see what things you notice about them. And then there will be some activities sent for you tomorrow that you can try to learn more about birds. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye.